I'll call the meeting to order. Madam Secretary, if you are ready, could we have a roll call, please? Mr. Ackerson, Ms. Billman, here. Mr. Fell, Mr. Fitch, here. Mr. Hopkins, here. Ms. Way Drago, here. Mr. Trail, Mr. Turner, and Ms. Hugh. We do have a quorum. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? We have uh, now to look at the minutes of the uh, January 18th, 2018 regular meeting of the Plan Commission. Mr. Trail, you're just moving your mic or was that a motion? <laughs> Move to approve the minutes. Sure, thank you, sir. I second the motion. Ms. Way Dargo seconds. Mr. Trail motion. Um, I do have two typos uh, that uh, I think we probably should fix. Um, on page five, um, the uh, fourth paragraph, uh, the begins, Mr. Trail asked if Mr. Tartar would like to see be developed, and I think if you change the word if to what, then it sounds like a typo to me. So that would say, Mr. Trail asked what Mr. Tartar would like to see be developed on the site other than single family homes. We also have on uh, page seven, the third paragraph, the last sentence, the surrounding property owners believe that they value of their properties would decrease. That, I think that's the value of their properties. So it would read, the surrounding owners believe that the values of their properties would decrease. Well, that's all I've got. We'll do a approval by voice vote. Uh, all those of, uh, in favor of approving the minutes as corrected, say aye. 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 Those opposed, the minutes are approved. Uh, communications. We have uh, several communications uh, that I will read into the record. Uh, they will be added to the record, and I will read who they're from and then give you the overall thrust of, of what the uh, letters are about. Uh, they are from Mr. Paul Devevic, Louise Cuny, Stephanie Sutton, Sarah McAvoy, Katie Hunter, and Sasha Rubel. These are all neighbors of the uh, proposed uh, subject of the plan case that we're going to hear tonight. Uh, they are all op opposed to the special use permit that is going to be in question there. The general reasons for their opposition are, number one, increased traffic and parking density. Uh, number two, some concern that the proposed uh, uh, attendance limits could not be enforced. There's, we'll talk about that more when we get to the case of what those proposals are. And those are the primary ones. There's also some concern about whether these owners would maintain the property. Um, and those are the general concerns. All, all these letters are opposed to the uh, proposed special use permit. We don't have any continued public hearings. Uh, we don't have any old business. Therefore, we will now move to new public hearings. We have a plan case number 2328SU18, a request by Frat Life LLC, represented by its manager and sole member, Jonah Weisskopf, on behalf of the church in Champaign, represented by two of its directors, Kenneth Moody and Nehemiah Tan, for a special use permit to operate a church at 713 West Ohio Street in the R7 University Residential Zoning District. So city, city staff will give a presentation. And then we'll begin taking uh, public input. And before we do that, I want to introduce our newest Plan Commission member, Shinshe Yu. Yeah, Shinshe Yu. Shinshe Yu. Uh, welcome Thank very you. much. Thank you. And um, so, Ms. Chair, I applied to be uh, recused myself. Okay. In this case, I was just approved by City Council this Monday. And uh, before my approval to join the Plan Commission, could you uh, speak into the microphone, please? I'm sorry. Is it turned on? The green light will come on. Yeah. I'm new. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Chair, I recused myself 
from this hearing because uh, my appointment was this Monday, and uh, before my appointment to the plan commission, I had speak with the uh, uh, the applicant about this case before, so I don't think it's appropriate for me to join the discussion for today. Thank you. Great, you're recused for a conflict of interest. Thank you. Yeah, and you can you sh should remove yourself. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Ricci. Good evening, Commission members. Um, the case before you is a request by Frat Life LLC, represented by its manager and sole member, Jonah Weisskopf, on behalf of the church in Champaign, represented by two of its directors, Kenneth Mooney and Nehemiah Tan, for a special use permit to operate a church at 713 West Ohio Street in the R7 University residential zoning district. Um, the Urbana zoning ordinance requires a special use permit to allow the proposed use in the R7 University residential zoning district. The rooming house use is permitted by right in that district. The church would operate in one part of the principal <coughs> structure while the rooming house would operate in another part. Frat Life LLC is the current owner of the property. It is applying for the special use permit on behalf of the church in Champaign. The plan commission must review the special use permit application, hold a public hearing, and make a recommendation to the Urbana City Council meeting um, that would then be heard by City Council on February 19th. Um, the Urbana City Council must then approve, approve with conditions, or deny the application. Uh, one note is that this request is identical to plan case 2324 SU 17, which had been made directly by Ken Mooney and Nehemiah Tan. Um, but because they were not the current owners of the property, they were not actually allowed to apply. So the current owner is now applying on their behalf. Um, the property is located at the southeast corner of West Ohio Street in South Busey, as shown on the screen. Um, and is currently the site of the Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity House. There are currently 18 tenants in the 21 bedroom house. The parking lot, which is 25 spaces, has two access drives off of South Busey Avenue. Uh, the South access drive is used as a parking space by a neighboring tenant. This use would stop at the end of that tenant's lease in August of 2018. The current land uses are varying intensities of residential, including single family duplex and medium and high density apartments. Uh, current land uses include single and multifamily residential and group homes, which includes rooming houses, boarding houses, and dormitories. And dormitory is defined as including cooperatives, fraternities, and sororities. There are currently three other group homes on this block of Ohio Street, plus an additional seven group homes in the adjacent blocks. And you can see that on Exhibit C, which I'll pull up. So here we have the subject property. There are three group homes on the opposite face of Ohio Street, and then there's an additional seven group homes here on the neighboring part, uh, block and along Lincoln Street. The house was constructed in 1927 and has always operated as a sorority or fraternity house. Until recently, it was listed with the University of Illinois' private certified housing office and was rated by that office for occupancy up to 40 persons. Occupancy has been slowly dropping from a recent high of 22 residents to 10 residents. Um, when property changed hands to the current owner, it increased to 18 residents last year. For the subject property, adaptive reuse as a combination church and rooming house would better utilize the building and keep it fully occupied and maintained. A recent example of adaptive reuse was the former Zeta Tau Alpha sorority house, a local historic landmark which has been vacant since 2009 and in disrepair, especially the interior. 
the applicant plans to maintain tenant occupation until it sells the property to the church in Champaign. The prospective buyer plans to reduce tenant occupation from its current 18 down to 10 residents and renting those to individual residents starting in August of 2018. The rooming house use is again permitted by right in this district. The rest of the building would be used as a church, which requires a special use permit in the R7 district. Church renovation is projected to begin in late 2018. Services for the church in Champaign are currently held at the Illini Union on Green Street and would be moved from there to this site. The main service would be on Sunday from 10 a.m. to noon. Other church-related activities would start as early as 8.30 on Monday through Friday for an affiliated organization's staff meeting. Group meetings are scheduled as late as 10 p.m., six days a week. Group sizes range from 6 to 45. The site plan, which I'll pull up. Shows the proposed access ramp here at the southwest corner. Off street parking lot reconfiguration, parking lot landscaping and screening, and parking lot shade trees, all as required by the zoning ordinance. The north access drive to the parking lot would be widened to allow two-way traffic. The south access drive would not be used and then would be screened with a fence. The parking lot would be screened from the rights of way and adjacent properties by new and existing fences and shrubbery as required by the zoning ordinance. Section 8.5 of the ordinance sets the number of required spaces based on the two proposed uses, the church and the rooming house. The church use requires one parking space for every five seats in the assembly hall, so 80 seats would require 16 parking spaces. The rooming house use requires one parking space for every two residents. 10 residents requires five additional parking spaces. This totals 21 parking spaces. The site plan indicates 22 parking spaces will be provided. Similarly, required bike parking spaces, which are shown here, very small are calculated at one for every two residents or five spaces required and the church use requires a number of parking spaces equal to 10 percent of car parking spaces required or two additional spaces uh, this totals 10 uh, the site plan shows that they're providing 10 parking spaces excuse me seven parking space bike parking spaces are required and the site plan shows 10 for an additional three if overflow parking is ever required, the applicants propose that the church patrons can park two blocks away at lot F11 at the McKinley Health Center, which is located at 1109 South Lincoln Avenue on the university campus. Maria McMullen with University Parking Services has confirmed that the lot is open to the public from Friday at 5 p.m. to Monday at 6 a.m. If overflow parking is needed outside of those times, church attendees can use the metered spaces in the lot which are open to the public. Staff did analyze the service times of other nearby houses of worship to determine any potential overlaps in traffic congestion or use of on-street parking and determined that the main conflict point would be with the Twin City Bible Church's Sunday services which run from 9 a.m. to 10.15 a.m. and from 10.45 a.m. to 12 noon. I conducted a parking survey this past Sunday on an hourly basis from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. before service started and during the two services and between the service and after the second service ended. Uh, the lot provides 137 spaces. Occupancy before the early service started was 21 cars or 15% occupancy. Occupancy during the services increased to 62 and 68 spaces or 45 and 50% respectively. Between services, the occupancy dropped to 53 spaces or 39%, and then after 1230 fell to 27 cars or 20% occupancy. On this day, the peak occupancy was 50%, leaving 69 spaces available for others to park. The weather was cold but not sleety, so my speculation is that more than the average number of people would be driving that day because they didn't want to be walking when it was 20 degrees outside. 
if every one of the 80 church attendees at the Church of Champaign Drove and 10 of the 22 spaces on site were being used by the residents, the 68 other attendees may have still had room to park in the McKinley Health Center lot. This is speculation based on several assumptions, but it also does not include uh, attempting to account for walkers and cyclists. I did count an increase of four bicycles from four to eight at the Twin City Bible Church during services and saw people leaving by bicycle at the end of the services. According to Twin City Bible Church staff, attendance averages 250 persons during the early service and 150 persons during the later services. If the occupancy of the McKinley Health Center parking lot increased by only 50 cars, it is evident that church attendees there are either finding other places to park or coming by foot, bike, or bus. Brad Bennett, assistant city engineer, assessed the public services available at the site and estimated that the proposed uses impacts to their remaining capacity would not be impacted. Uh, the 22 space parking lot could generate up to 132 trips per day and this peak hourly trip generation would yield a three car per minute ingress egress frequency during a church related event and that this trip generation would not add to congestion. Therefore, he determined that the traffic impact at this location would be nominal with modest additional traffic on South Busey or West Ohio Street when events end. On December 12th, 2017, over 20 people attended a public meeting organized by the prospective buyer at the Urbana Civic Center regarding the proposed use. Several attendees expressed concerns regarding potential over-occupancy of the church assembly hall. City staff responded that this could be addressed by including a condition in the special use permit limiting occupancy of the assembly hall to 80 persons, which would be serviced by the available parking. Another concern expressed was potential light trespass from exterior lighting. In addition to the opinions expressed during the meeting, 10 city residents have submitted letters of support for the proposed use, one with a con con recommended condition. After the memo was released, we received an additional, I believe, six letters. According to Section 74A of the Urbana Zoning Ordinance, an application for a special use permit shall demonstrate the following three criteria. That the proposed use is conducive to the public convenience at that location is the first criteria. According to the staff report and the pro information provided by the applicant, the proposed use is conducive to the public convenience at this location due to its proximity to Lincoln Avenue and to the university. The property is located in a residential neighborhood near the university and one block from Lincoln Avenue, is served by sidewalks on both sides of the street, and is within walking distance for their primary audience of interest, university students. Over two-thirds of the current congregation are students. The church is the meeting place for the university's Christians on Campus Registered Student Organization. There is a public transit stop less than two blocks away and proposed parking for 10 bicycles on site, reducing the need for individuals to drive to the church. The site's proximity to Lincoln Avenue reduces the depth of incursion into a residential neighborhood by people driving to the church and increases its connectivity to a greater population base with direct access to intercity minor arterial roads. The second criteria is that the proposed use is designated excuse me, designed, located, and proposed to be operated so that it will not be unreasonably injurious or detrimental to the district in which it shall be located or otherwise injurious to the public welfare. The proposed use will not be unreasonably injurious to the public at this location. The church would relocate its services from the Illini Union to this property. The most attended service occurs between the two services at Twin City Bible Church which is two blocks away, which begin at 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. The staggered service times should minimize traffic, we won't eliminate it, except for the final service dismissal. Other planned service times do not appear to conflict with Twin City Bible Church or other nearby houses of worship. The proposed church plans to provide one off-street parking space more than is required. All services should be finished by 10 p.m. 
The applicants state that there will be no alcohol consumption, no late night parties, and no loud music. A quiet time will be imposed for residents, and all non-residents will have to leave the building by 11 p.m. A house coordinator will be designated among the residents to keep order, and the church elders and deacons will oversee the building's operation. The third criteria is that the proposed use conforms to the applicable regulations and standards of and preserves the essential character of the district in which it shall be located, except where such regulations and standards are modified by Section 7.7. The character of this R7 University Residential District will be preserved if the proposed special use permit is granted. The property has been used as a, fr as a fraternity or sorority since the late 1920s with as many as 40 residents and with recent occupancies of more than 20 residents. Nearby residents have become accustomed to activity outside the home, many cars in the lot, and traffic to the house. The proposed use would limit the number of full-time residents to 10. Although Sunday services may bring additional traffic for a short period of time, the applicants believe, based on their experience at the Illini Union, that many attendees will walk, bike, or take the bus to services. They will provide more than the required number of bicycle and automobile parking spaces and will fully screen the parking lot as required. The proposed development would conform to applicable regulations for the R7 University Residential District. I want to bring up the zoning map here and just indicate that these green dotted areas are the R7 University Residential District. So it does extend west across to South Busey Avenue and then up along and down Lincoln Avenue and it's not contiguous but nearby to the other three group homes that are zoned R7 University Residential. The Plan Commission shall determine whether the reasons set forth in the applications and the evidence adduced during the public hearing justify the granting of the special use permit and whether the public uses will, proposed uses will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning ordinance. In addition, the Plan Commission shall make a recommendation to the City Council for or against the proposed special use and may also recommend such additional conditions and requirements on the operation of the proposed uses as are appropriate or necessary for the public health, safety, and welfare and to carry out the purposes of this ordinance. These conditions can regulate the location, extent, and intensity of such uses, require adherence to an approved site plan, require landscaping and the screening of such use by means of fences, walls, or vegetation, stipulate a required minimum lot size or other dimensions, regulate vehicular access and volume, require conformance to health, safety, and sanitation requirements, regulate signs and outdoor lighting, and any other conditions deemed necessary to affect the purposes of the zoning ordinance. Staff proposes two conditions that are designed to address two of the concerns that arose at the neighborhood meeting on December 12th. The first is regarding concern over limiting the occupancy of the assembly room. The second is regarding spillover lighting in the parking lot. In addition to li limiting occupancy as a condition of the special use permit, occupancy can be limited by including an occupancy limit for the main assembly hall or any of the other rooms on the certificate of occupancy. Staff recommends occupancy of the main church assembly room be established and placarded by the building official and fire marshal to not exceed 80 persons. Enforcement of this condition would be twofold through both the zoning ordinance and the building code. Section 7.5 of the zoning ordinance states that violation of the special use permits conditions may result in revocation of the permit by the zoning administrator. Section 111.4 of the city's building code states that violation of the certificate of occupancy's limit may result in revocation of the certificate by the building official. John Snyder, the city building official, is in attendance tonight if anyone has questions regarding this or other building code specifics. Either revocation of the certificate of occupancy or the special use permit would require termination of the use as a church 
revocation of the certificate may result in vacation of that portion of the building in violation. In addition to the required screening fences and landscaping, Section 6.8 of the Zoning Ordinance addresses light trespass and nuisances. Section 6.8D states that lighting shall be aimed or shielded so as not to cause a nuisance to the public or nearby properties. And Section C3 allows the Zoning Administrator to order removal of light fixtures found to be a nuisance or causing excessive glare. Staff recommends a condition to limit the height of new exterior lighting fixtures to 12 feet. In the summary of findings, Frat Life LLC, represented by its manager and sole member Jonah Weisskopf, requests a special use permit to allow the church in Champaign to operate a church at 713 West Ohio Street in the R7 district. The proposed use is conducive to the public convenience at this location due to its proximity to both the university where the majority of its congregants are and live and to public transit and bicycle parking. The proposed use would not be reasonably unreasonably injurious or detrimental to the R7 district in which it shall be located due to both the coordination of service times to minimize traffic conflicts and to provision of more than the required number of off street car parking spaces. The proposed use meets the regulations and standards of and preserves the essential character of the R7 University Residential District in which it shall be located by limiting the number of church assembly hall occupants as well as boarders, providing more than the required number of off street parking spaces and screening the parking lot from adjacent properties. The options available to the plan commission in this case are one, to recommend approval of the special use permit without any additional conditions. Two, to recommend approval of the special use permit with any conditions deemed appropriate or necessary for the public health, safety, and welfare, and to carry out the purposes of the zoning ordinance. Or three, to recommend denial of the special use permit. Based on the evidence presented in the discussion above and without the benefit of considering additional evidence that may be presented at this public hearing, staff recommends that the plan commission forward plan case number 2328-SU-18 to the Urbana City Council with a recommendation for approval with the following conditions. Number one, construction must be in general conformance with the attached site plan entitled Church Ramp Ramp Construction 713 West Ohio and dated January 26th, 2018. Number two, the occupancy of the main church assembly room will be established and placarded by the building official and fire marshal to not exceed 80 persons. Condition three, church events conclude by 11.30 p.m. Condition four, any future exterior lighting fixtures may be no taller than 12 feet. Condition five, the use must conform to all applicable zoning, building, and development regulations. Thank you, and that is the end of the staff report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ricci. Any questions for city staff? Mr. Hopkins. Um, I guess two questions. The, the special use permit is being applied for by the current owner. Correct. The special use permit, once granted, belongs to the property? Correct. And transfers to the new owner? Yes, or any future owners. Okay. Um, uh, the second thing, on the placarding of the main assembly room. Yes. An assembly room that would meet code for occupancy by 80 exists in this building? I am not sure at this point. I have not reviewed building plans, well, and that is not part of the special use permit process. It could be. But if we're going to make it a condition. The intent there was that uh, it is presumed that it could be more than 80 unless we place a condition on it which sets it not to exceed 80. So I suppose we could reword that to ensure that um, either what would typically be allowed per code or the 80, whichever is less, we could do it that way. Uh, if you're concerned that there might be a conflict with code and the condition. Okay, I mean, some of this goes to later, but do we have 
um, floor plans? Do we know anything about the interior of the building? Building safety staff have walked through okay. the building and met with the current owner and there have been discussions about future use okay but final building plans have not been submitted and are probably somewhat contingent upon the answers and permits that are provided and granted i believe there is room in this building currently to create or renovate a room that would be suitable for 80 persons the applicant, the current owner, and the proposed buyer are here tonight and would probably be able to better answer those questions. Okay. That's it. Mr. Trail? Um, was the 8010 request the original request or did it grow out of conversations about parking? The which? 80 it, occupants in the assembly hall and 10 residents I mean on which are basically the basis of that you came about that they're within the parking was the, that the original, the original application um, was uh, and this was in the original application submitted by mr. Mooney and tan um, <coughs> was around that 80 number 80 to 85 and that was brought down to 80 so that the feasible number of parking spaces in the lot would be able to service the uh, people that would be in attendance so if the parking lot would have been smaller then presumably they would have reduced the number of persons that would be permitted to occupy the assembly room and the same with the 10 residents um, there are I believe 20 bedrooms currently there and so the main intent was to provide a church with additional residences and I'm not sure why they picked 10 but that math was also considered you know you start with parking spaces as you're limiting and then you work that down okay we would like to have as many attendees at the church service so that allows us roughly this many residents that can live there again for right. uh, additional detail the applicant and the prospective buyer would be better I think you've answered answer. my question thank okay. you uh, a quick other question at least one uh, what's the history of the R7 zoning I have to ask that because I keep seeing the word grandfathered in comments uh, I assume there was a prior zoning in this property I assume that perhaps the R7 zoning was added at a later time than other residential zones I am not it? well versed in that that happened before my time I would defer to Ms. Pearson if she would like to answer um, I'm off the top of my head I'm not sure what that references to because group homes are a permitted use in R7 so perhaps it's the size of the of the homes that might kick it into another category the, the implication in the comments was that it was an R2 at one time and when an R7 was created it was placed under it I mean at least that's my reading of it you're talking about comments by other comments people, comments it's by so it's not a, okay it's not a legal definition no no, so, no. I, I'm just trying to get a little bit right. of well, the I, history I, when I will state from a from a planning perspective if you create or you see the need for an additional zoning district to better reflect and better administer and regulate uses then you create that new zoning district and you would then rezone the properties that are that existing not use to that it, new zoning not district it, just trying to get it if anyone knows has a feel for the history how we got to the situation okay. we're in today um how many other churches are there in the area Mm. I know in the area is a kind of amorphous so the closest is Twin City Bible Church and um, there with. are probably um, three or four others mm -hmm. within four blocks and another four or five within an additional eight or nine blocks but when I looked at when their service times are some of them uh, are once or twice a week sometimes in the evenings 
and none of those were close to where this proposed church is going to be. Are so any that, of them in, currently in R7 zoning? I don't know. Okay. I did not investigate that. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? Ms. Bilbin. Um, yeah, page six, first paragraph in the middle. Uh, the pro proposed use would limit the number of full-time residents to 10, as he mentioned. Uh, that I don't see that in the conditional use in the conditions to approve. Um, that's because the rooming house use is permitted by right in the R7 zoning district, so its use is not, should not be part of the special use permit because it's permitted by right. Okay, so limiting it to 10 is we cannot enforce that. I did not say that. I, that was not a staff recommendation. Okay. If, if the plan commission saw the need to limit the number of residents, I would say that if more residents were permitted, they would have to meet the parking needs for that. And if the parking lot doesn't allow for additional residents to be there, then that certificate of occupancy would not be issued for those additional Thank you. Further questions, Ms. Bilman? Nope. Anybody else? Questions? I've got a couple of questions. Um, first one is you, you mentioned that uh, when the, uh, I guess the, the access drive to the south is, is going to be blocked off so that they can screen that side of the parking lot. And right now that's being used by another property? Yes. And so is that, the, is that the, like a duplex next door? Yes. And where will those cars park? There is a driveway on the there's, south side of that house, uh -huh. or there's also on-street parking. That will that, that make that property owner in compliance with the parking, minimum parking requirement? I did not investigate whether that would throw their parking out of compliance or not. The issue there, and the reason we identified it as an issue, is because uh, when a project comes forward as a special use permit, we like the site to be brought into compliance with today's standards to the best of its ability. So uh, parking is not allowed. You cannot directly um, pull out onto the street for parking unless it's a single family or a duplex. So to um, use that parking on this property um, for the church use or those residential uses technically does not comply with their zoning ordinance. I appreciate that. My question is, will we throw the other property owner out of compliance by taking those spaces away? Um, I believe... But you can't answer that today. It's not really this case, but it, correct. it's of concern. Yes, and, and it's a valid concern. Um, you know, the other option that they had was to make this a, a two-way flow-through driveway, which they preferred not to. Um, the driveway won't be blocked by decommissioning it. There will simply right, the be a will fence just, you, you won't be able to get in a lot from that right. angle. And also blocking headlights and right. activity from the lot. Okay, the office space is, uh, they talked about, we, again, we haven't seen a, an actual building plan, but the memo talks about office space. Um, if it, it, first of all, is there a parking required for those offices in addition to what is required for the residents and the attendants? So my presumption is that the zoning ordinance is written with f figuring and calculating the parking based on the congregation size as proxied by the capacity of the main assembly mm -hmm. room. So those it does not state additional parking spaces are required to facilitate parking by staff or whatever exactly or visitors it's just one okay. parking space per five seats in the assembly hall now uh if if uh another if the property were to change hands yes could those uh, offices be converted back into residential units only if additional parking was 
created on the lot. Mm -hmm. Or if they came and proposed a, an amendment to their special use permit that said, we would like you to limit our main assembly room from 80 persons down to 60 persons so that we could have more parking for additional residents. And uh, so in your opinion, is the site plan as currently constructed sufficient to add those spaces without doing something to the building? We, I do not believe additional parking spaces can be added okay. to this parking lot without the zoning ordinance does allow for off-site parking, though. I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. You might have to procure off-site parking. Right. Right. Good okay. point. Thank you. Uh, well, that's all I've got. Anything further? No. Nope. Thank you, Mr. Ricci. Thank you. Let me now outline the uh, procedures. Oh, oh um, one more thing. The applicant, Jonah Weisskopf, representing Frat Life LLC, is here and has a presentation, Great. as well as the proposed buyer, uh, Ken Mooney, is here and would like to present to the Planning Commission. Great, thank you. Outline the, the uh, procedures for a public hearing. Uh, first, we will hear from the petitioner, uh, being allowed to uh, make their case of why this uh, proposal should be adopted. We will then hear from others who are in support of the petitioner. Um, and and uh, g then we will have, give opponents the chance to address the commission. Uh, and then the petitioner may uh, address the commission again, and following that, we will close the public input portion and then discuss the matter, possibly vote on it. Um, I would like to see a show of hands and, and ask how many people, other than the petitioner, want to address the plan commission tonight. Okay, great. I'll, I'll not put a hard time limit on you. I just want to make sure we weren't going to have 30 people coming up. And in, in which case, I would have had to limit the time. But, okay, so Mr. Petitioner, uh, Mr. Weisskopf, if you want to address us now, please come to the uh, mic. And if you could both just uh, sign the paper and state your name for the record. <clears throat> Jonah Weisskopf. Thank you. And sir? Ken Mooney. Ken Mooney, great. Ken, get you in. Right, right. <clears throat> Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. Um, I just wanted to provide some background information sort of firsthand from the owner slash landlord, which is me. Um, I purchased 713 West Ohio in the spring of 2016. Since I have bought the building, I have rented it to Delta Kappa Epsilon. They are on their second year of residence in the building. After I bought the building, it was inspected through the Urbana Rental Inspection Program in the summer of 2016. In addition to the updates I did for the city of Urbana, I also put about $70,000 into the building, including but not limited to improving drainage around the foundation, refinishing hardwood floors, new gutters, <clears throat> new kitchen appliances, new water heaters, new cafeteria floor, and repainting the entire interior of the structure. On a semi-regular basis, <clears throat> over the past two years, I am called over to 713 West Ohio by the fire department at 2 a.m. on the weekends. Red cups and beer cans often litter the yard both in the front and in the back. It is not uncommon for loud parties to all ends of the night with large groups of students spill out into the yard. Over winter break, <clears throat> I found myself cleaning the cafeteria walls which were coated with random food debris and I don't know what happened <clears throat> I meet the kids and their parents and talk with them one-on-one -on -one, and they're very nice and I like them um, but the reality of 20 unsupervised males aged 19 to 22 is hard on the building and hard for some of the direct neighbors fraternity culture is not worth preserving on the 700 block of West Ohio this past Sunday, <clears throat> a few days ago, I received a typical email of the types of emails I receive on a semi-regular basis. <clears throat> Hi, Jonah. I don't know if the police were called again last night, but the residents of 713 West Ohio had another thumping base party starting around 10 p.m., and today the litter around the house has reached truly unacceptable levels. 
Plastic cups and other kinds of party refuse are strewn in front of the house along Ohio Street. In the parking lot facing where I live, in the grassy area between the parking lot and Busey Avenue. Can you ask the residents to clean this up ASAP? There are only two more fraternity houses left on West Ohio Street, 713 West Ohio and 606 West Ohio. A special use permit for 713 West Ohio is a chance to preserve a Greek building while diminishing the negative impact of frat houses on the block. Please take advantage of this opportunity and grant 713 West Ohio the special use permit. Thank you. He, he's the main course. I'm just the appetizer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. Again, uh, my name is Ken Mooney, and we're uh, we're with the uh, church in Champaign. We will uh, rename to the church in Urbana should we get this building. <laughs> uh, but we're uh, uh, about 60 to 70 of us meet on Sundays in the uh, Alana Union, which speaks to why we picked the number 80. Uh, it fit the building, it fit the parking requirement, and it fit our size. Um, typically, we uh, this is by one of, uh, by the way, what you see there is one of our uh, Friday night group meetings that meets in one of the, one of the homes. Um, and on any given Friday night, this would be one of the homes. On a given Friday night, one of these could be meeting in that facility also. But generally, they meet in, um, in homes. Uh, they meet in my home. Not this specific group, but some of them. Uh, so we meet on Sundays 10 to 12, typically 60 to 70. Um, and recently, um, one of our members, one of our deacons, made the comment we, we, right after we had a meeting, it was 72. He said, our meetings are getting too big. We need to split it in half. The way we have function is we want the members to be able to speak what they have been studying in the Bible to one another. Uh, generally speaking, we're, we don't function like other organizations uh, with a pastor speaking to a large congregation. We prefer to have smaller congregations in, in the um, fashion of Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, each one has. So different members come, speak of their experience in the Bible to one another. And when we do need to have a big meeting, we have other locations, not this one, not the one we're looking to buy. Uh, from time to time, we rent, in fact, in two, 2019, we'll be renting the Allstate Center for a large meeting, a large gathering. Uh, but when we need large gatherings, we have other places. This is not... This is not the intention, is to have a large gathering in this facility. Uh, we have spread from Champaign to Normal and to Peoria. That's typically how we function. Uh, so ones meet with us, they get some experience in how to practice the church life in a New Testament fashion, and then go to other cities. Uh, my stepson lives in Germany now. He used to live here and, 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 and meet here. Uh, we have sent ones to the UK, to Pakistan, to other places. So we're not, we, we're, our goal is not to have a huge congregation. Our goal is to be able to help members un, uh, know how to practice according to our understanding of the Bible and then go to other cities. So this is really a, you could call it a training ground for us. Uh, that's really our, our goal, uh, is to be able to help ones uh, practice in the way we see the New Testament. Now, every, every church group has its mission. Uh, has its focus, and this is what this is our focus. Some some like to have a large congregation, uh, and that's not our focus. That's not our desire. Uh, <clears throat> Eighty would be fine for us. Uh, so actually, since we have an extra parking place, we didn't think we would have. At some point, we may decide to yeah, ask for eighty-five. Um, but right now, we're running sixty to seventy on a Sunday morning, and that's going to be just you know that's going to be be fine for us. Should there, let me just run through a couple of these pictures, by the way. This is, again, this is one of our groups. Let's see here. Another group. This is the one that happens to meet in my house and other places. This is another group that meets in one of the homes. 
you see a, a lot of diversity uh, among, the, among the members uh, and two-thirds of our, our students. This is another group. They were having a, they were all attended a function, uh, I believe it may have been to the Craner Center. Uh, the cello, you see the cello, cellist there. And this is the same group hanging out in someone's living room the next day, <laughs> kind of relaxing. Um, so basically, we have students, undergrads, grad students, PhD students, some postdocs. And whoever's living in this building will be of this, this category. Uh, they will be uh, undergrads, grad students, um, postdocs, PhD students, and so forth. Concerning parking, oh, okay, this, sorry, okay, here's a typical Sunday morning meeting of ours in the uh, room 314A of the Illini Union. You see the, you generally sit around in a square, and again, you see the diversity of the group. Concerning parking, this was a picture on the uh, 17th of December. There's two pictures on the 17th of December showing overflow parking at McKinley Center. 28th of January, two pictures. 4th of February, two pictures. The 4th of February is where Mr. Risi made his count as well. In fact, we were probably out there at the same time and didn't even know it. <laughs> um, but this shows you the amount of space that's available there. Uh, and on two other occasions, uh, November 12th, one of our members counted 44 open spaces. Um, on September 24th, uh, I, we didn't count, but again, there was ample space. So we've five different times on Sunday morning, we've gone to that facility and seen an abundance of open spaces. We at the most would ever need five to ten. And uh, so that's, that's kind of, that's the, uh, what we're seeing as far as space goes there. Uh, now, in some of the uh, comments, said something about us starting at seven o'clock in the morning. I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> But just we don't start at 7 o'clock in the morning ever. Uh, the earliest we start is 8.30. Uh, and, and basically, for the most part, our congregational portion, which would be small in the evenings, will be done by 9, 9.30. Um, that's generally, um, and sm uh, a small group might hang around a little bit longer. Uh, so now students, particularly PhD students, uh, we had one a chemical engineer, or another person who was working with the food science department. From time to time, they need to go out and check experiments uh, at one and two in the morning. So yes, someone, you may see someone going out of the building at strange hours in the morning simply because that's the requirement of their, their studies. Um, the, they have to check um, how um, cultures are growing. Uh, we had a chemical engineering student, a young lady who would be out to be as hours in the morning because of group project. So these, these, so you do get this type of traffic, odd hours traffic, but it's not a large congregation. It's students doing their job as students. And I'm sure the fraternity has the same issues. Any place where there are students living, if you had any students living in your home, you would, you would experience the same thing as well. And um, as far as, uh, so that's a parking. Uh, Mr. Vici, I think, addressed the con attendance control, but again, we're not, des we're not desiring to, to become a big, a big congregation. Um, and concerning not being able to maintain the building, uh, our plans are we're going to pay, we're to pay cash for the building, to buy it for cash, and an put an additional uh, probably $120,000 into the building to take care of the ADA requirements and some other issues that, that Need to be taken care of. In one of the uh, comments that was made, it's a, the uh, electric system was done in the 1950s. It's, it's not accurate. It was actually in the 90s. I was, I was in there with building inspectors. Uh, the electrical system was upgraded in the, in the 19, mid 1990s. Uh, it's completely up to code. Um, had an inspector calling all over the roof. Uh, roof is in very good shape. Um, 
and cost $960 to take care of the few issues with the roof. So the building itself is in, is in good shape. It does need a very good cleaning. Uh, as, <laughs> as Marcus, as, as, sorry. Mr. Mooney, I don't, say, I don't think it's the plan commission's role to no. determine whether you're good landlords or owners or, or okay. whether you're going to maintain the condition of the building. This is a special use permit case dealing with the use of the building. Okay. I just mentioned that because it was, it was brought up in the, in the communications. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So. okay. But anyway, this is our plan. We, we, have a, we do have a plan that we would be able to take care of, of the building by paying cash for it and cleaning it, taking care of it right at the very beginning. And with the borders, we'll be able to take care of the um, monthly maintenance and, and so forth of the building. Great. So that's, that's, that's my, you know, basically my presentation. Questions? Okay. Yeah, any questions for Mr. Mooney? Mr. Hopkins. Um, between the two of you, you presumably can tell us a little bit about the inside of the building. Um, Implicitly, the notion of the occupancy control would be total occupancy, and yet our mechanism of enforcement is room occupancy. Hmm. Are you, do you have a plan for actual use of the spaces in the building? We, okay, first off, the original, the, in the early question, there is a space big enough to easily accommodate 80 persons in the building. That, that is it, there. It exists. It exists. Okay. Yes, it exists. Okay. It exists now. Um, the, uh, yes, it exists. Now, some of the other spaces will be used for things like children's meeting, take, taking care of a Sunday school, um, for, uh, one of the other spaces will be used for our group that meets on, mon on Monday through fr Friday mornings. We'll use a separate space for that. We'll be, have a group that, um, we'll, for book sales. We'll have a, group, a, a special space for book sales. So we have, we have uses for these other spaces, that the, but that doesn't mean they're going to be occupied all the, all the time. Um, when, when, the, when the congregation is meeting, that's where, every, that's where the, the members are. When the congregation is meeting Sunday morning. Uh, we don't foresee a, 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 a ever a situation where during other uh, uh, other than our peak time Sunday morning, we don't see an issue where we would uh, go outside of the, re the required need. When you describe Sunday school, mm -hmm. this is in addition to eighty. That includes children. The eighty is the eight. Actually, the eighties. The adults are counted as part of the eighty. And the children are not? The children are not. That is correct. Okay, so how many children? Right now we have four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're college students. They, we're, yeah, we have, I, we, do I they drive? Just trying to get a sense <laughs> yeah. for the building, which I think is... And I think four is a high room. number, actually. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's about four. I think a couple. Okay. They're okay, toddlers. Okay, right. thank you. Further questions? Mr. Chow? No? All right, gentlemen, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Does anybody else uh, wish to address the commission in support of the petition? Does anybody, oh, sir, please come forward. If you could please sign the paper and state your name. Okay. Uh, my name is Tim Chow, C-H-A-O. So I prepare a statement uh, in support of the, um, the proposed plan. Um, and then I just want to share a little bit about my personal experience with the group. So I, my hope is that um, it will gear, give a clear view of uh, an individual experience with the group and how that will impact the community. Um, so I own a house on Busey. Uh, which is not too far from the the property, and I'm a member of a church. I've been meeting with the group for about 10 years. And I, I would like to share some personal experience about the group and why I think it's a good fit for the neighborhood. So, and then actually, um, Mr. Mooney has, you know, kind of described some of the key points. 
And I want to just I point it out very clearly that the format of how the group meet or worship is very, very different from a typical, let's say, uh, evangelical church or uh, like a mega church style. There's no Christian rock element at all, actually, how they worship. Uh, there's no drums, there's no band. <laughs> For the music part of it, uh, it's mostly acoustic guitar or piano at the most. And, and the main reason of that is that the members are encouraged um, to sing and to get spiritually inspired, but not treated as a concert. Um, and also, you know, through the pictures we have seen that it is very, very common to me as gro uh, small groups, and that's the characteristics of the group, that we have families and residents from the communities, but also, you know, a lot of students and grad students, that families and the residents from the community in the congregation regularly open up their homes, and that's also one of the key points that we regularly eat you know, together and we will share um, the studies in the Bible with one another and then you know, we'll just kind of like, you know, you invite your friends over, you know, you will talk and uh, share your experience. And a part of that is because they, we also believe that part of the Christian living um, is like a daily walk. You know, you enjoyed it every day in a simple way, and that really summarize, you know, the, the trade, you know, of the church and how, they, how we meet together. So we're very mindful of the community feedbacks, too, you know, as a church, and um, there might be some comments before about the Michigan House be prior to these, and one of the things I can um, testify is that before, in that situation that, uh, about concerning the Michigan House, on the parking issues, the senior members always remind everyone who visit that house to not use the street parking and park in the McKinley uh, building, which is very close to the property. So there are no, I believe there are no, you know, no plan for big signage. There's no expansion of the building. And really, they're re really are looking for a place where the communities can serve the students and can meet and work and be part of the neighborhood. Um, and I also, you know, just to bry up, you know, my, my house on Busey is actually not too far from uh, a recent shooting on Springfield, which is a frat house. And I think everyone's familiar with that incident. And I actually live right behind that house. And I personally witnessed, you know, people are running away and people are in panic. Um, so it's like a, it's a very dramatic comparison when you offer or when the building can be continued to use as a frat house um, that um, potentially bring more fire trucks or ambulance or it can be an organization that's composed of families from the neighborhood already and that's mindful of the community and the, resi you know, the residential um, characteristics um, and want to work with the community. So for these, I absolutely support the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil Fisella, um, uh, just a second. All right, I am uh, in the process, almost finished, renovating 701 West Ohio, so same side of the street, about six or seven houses down. Um, it had been abandoned since 1994. So um, I have a significant investment in the neighborhood, uh, you know, putting around $300,000 into this house, and I plan to be involved in the neighborhood for a long time to come. Um, when I heard about this proposal, I was excited for a number of reasons. Um, but I think the one I'd, I'd like to talk about most that impresses me about this group is, um, like, like, is it Dr. Mooney or uh, this Mr. Mooney. Ken Mooney, Mr. Mooney mentioned? The diversity of the group impresses me, and I think um, 
it's something we really need to focus on as a community as we move forward and, and adapt to changing demographics and the changing face of the University of Illinois. I think um, anything we can do to help, I guess, just the influx of new students from Asia to sort of settle down in Urbana, invest, buy homes, and really feel at home here and become a part of our community is a good thing. If we want to continue to keep selling homes in Urbana, getting students to live here, rent apartments here, become a part of the community, go to the farmer's market, I think having things like a, a church that, you know, has its roots in Taiwan and, you know, attracts members, you know, to get off of campus and to come into West Urbana and to sort of see that there's more than just, you know, from Lincoln to First Street to campus, you know, we want these people to become a part of Urbana. And, uh, you know, maybe when they're done with their PhD or whatever they're here for, maybe they'll decide to stay. Um, so that's, I think, the most interesting thing about this to me. The other side of it that I saw um, a lot of other people talking about was the potential loss in tax revenue. But again, I think when the General Assembly and the Constitutional Convention allowed for an exemption for religious institutions in the 1970 Constitution, I think that they had some foresight in allowing that because I think that having a church in the neighborhood again, it shouldn't be seen as a hole or a loss or something that's sucking away resources. I think the church is there to support the residents. Um, so, you know, these kids need a place to study, they need a place for community, they need uh, that institution. I think, uh, I think that's a really good thing to have and again, I think it would be good for the neighborhood to, to have something like that in West Urbana to really help sort of integrate town and gown, so to speak, so. Great, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Pacella, Mr. Hopkins? The property you own is a? Single family residence, five bedroom, two bath, just normal okay. house. Okay. Mr. Trail? I just kind of a quick question. A lot of this, the, the conversation is around this particular church, but in essence, we're granting a special use for any church. Or religious institution of any kind, I suppose. Right. Yeah. So I, I, you seem impressed with this particular church. Would how much of your support is the fact that you think a church is a great thing, regardless of the congregation, the whatever, or that is it because you think this particular church would be a? I think a church in general would be a good thing to have on the block. Um, I guess one more experience we've had with doing construction has been. Um, the city staff were kind enough to give us a special uh, parking permit to block off a few spaces for our crew, but uh, when we first started moving construction equipment on and off the property, and we're talking cranes and lifts, just a significant amount of work to be done there with the roof, we, we had some people, we just left notes on their cars, hey, please move your car for a day or so so we can get this crane off the property. And, we began to notice the cars didn't move for a week or two weeks. <laughs> and then as soon as winter break hit, the entire street was empty. And I know there's only 18 kids living here now, but down the road, I think the flip side of that is we could have a fraternity with 40 kids here again. So I feel like it would be nice to get rid of some of the Greek beds on the block. And I think any church, I haven't had too many bad experiences with churches as neighbors um, thus far. So that's, that's kind of my comfort area. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak in support? Sir? If you could state, state your name for the record as well. Sure, my name is Steve Ross. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't have much to say, but I live at uh, 609 West Green Street, which is directly across the street from two congregations, not one, two, the First Presbyterian Church of Urbana and the Korean Church of Champaign-Urbana. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, as neighbors, they are good. They are fine. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, gladly, they're much better, let's put it this way, in terms of noise and trash and every other distraction you can think of than some of the apartment buildings and group living arrangements around our house, which are pretty much, you know, full of students. Uh, so, uh, I guess my, my point is if the church gets denied on Ohio Street, I hope they look on Green Street because I would gladly swap out one for another. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Ross? Oh, I don't think so. Thank you, sir. 
Okay, any other proponents? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any, anyone opposed to this uh, uh, request wish to speak to the Planning Commission? Sir? And if you could please sign in, state your name, that would be great. Hi, my name is uh, Pete Colston. I live at uh, 710 West Indiana Avenue, which is about one backyard away from the parking lot. And um, we've been suffering from the, those fraternities for, well, my, my family's owned that house since 1968. And so uh, we moved into it about eight years ago. And so we've seen three fraternities come and go with, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Three, three fraternities come and go and they're all, um, they're all pretty bad, but um, the, uh, I'm sure, and I'm sure these are fine people and would make good neighbors, but um, there's a noise issue. That, that parking lot, um, we don't have central air. I'm sure you know, many others around that area don't, so we have our windows open for most of the year, you know, aside from this time of year. And um, you know, the cars, they come and go you know, at all hours of the night. Um, you say here that you're, mi you're your meeting will finish by 11.30 p.m. Well, you know, I'd say most of the neighborhood's long, long asleep by then. Um, the, uh, I mean, this is gonna be a huge increase in density and, and the, staff's, uh, the staff's presentation seemed like it was um, kind of uh, slanted towards, <coughs> you know, getting the permit rather than, you know, how is this gonna affect the neighborhood with, um, I can tell you, a lot of people, they don't park over in that uh, McKinnon Health Center. That's why that lot is always empty, because they always fill up in the neighborhoods, well, you know, which is fine, but um, I mean, it's a huge increase in density, you know, meetings five times a week, seven, seven days a week, I don't know what it is. Um, I mean, that's, the fraternities don't even meet that much. They're mostly only noisy on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And um, so maybe there's some kind of remediation they can do, like, um, you know, agree to, you know, get in their cars and go at 10 o'clock, say, rather than 11.30. Um, you know, people get out of the meetings, they don't just get up and go, they stand around in that parking lot and they talk for an hour, you know. And so, um, you know, maybe there could be some kind of, um, you know, agreement to, uh, you know, not, you know, start your meetings earlier and end earlier. And um, you know, as to uh, the parking, well, and I don't know what to say about that. Um, you know, parking's free on the weekend anywhere, so I mean, it doesn't really matter um, if they park in their parking lot or not. But I'm just, I just think that it would be nice to have some uh, kind of agreement to lim limit the hours of uh, the meetings in the evening. So, uh, I, I will point out, Mr. Colson, that the church, the, according to the memo, the, the latest their hours their meetings would go would be 10 p.m. Uh, 11.30 is the suggestion of city staff for, for a condition to be applied should we choose to approve this special use permit. We are at liberty to change that uh, and make it 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock or, yeah. you know, really any time that, that we choose that's reasonable. Um, so we may take that into consideration during discussion. Yeah, I mean, well, the first I heard about this church was they, re they sent a letter and they said, they remarked how calm and peaceful and pleasant the environment around the building was during the midday time frame. Well, it's nice and peace, pleasant and quiet, um, you know, the whole time. It's not just, you know, midday. So, you know, bringing 70 or 80 people in to meet, you know, seven days a week, you know, that's a significant degradation of the peace and quiet in the neighborhood. And so, you know, I would just like to see that somehow mitigated. So. Great. Any further questions? For no? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else who is opposed to this request? And if you could please sign the paper and state your name. Kate Hunter. Thank you. I live at 510 West Oregon Street. Um, grab some things here I 
I've lived in Urbana most of my life, and I've lived in the West Urbana neighborhood for the past 45 years. I've observed the neighborhood over that time, and I find that it's an area to which our residents, both homeowners and tenants, are strongly attached. My comments tonight are based on concern for the future of this area in particular as it relates to the preservation of our housing stock and to the issue of livability for our residents. The name on the original application was Mr. Ken Mooney who spoke earlier. And we've seen that name before in 2008 in a case before this same commission. Mr. Mooney does not own that property. The owners live in Anaheim, California. But Mr. Mooney seems to be their agent here. That property on Michigan is a single family R2 property. But after it was acquired in 2007 by this same organization, there were complaints from the neighbors about the use of the building, in particular parking problems there, and high levels of activity as visitors came and went. The city determined that the use was illegal at that, for that type of property. So Mr. Mooney filed an application for a special use permit for 811 West Michigan. Um, that application was denied and the reasons, it was di it's different because it was an R2 property, so I don't need to go into that. But um, they were ordered to cease and desist their activities at that address. This is pertinent information. It's the same people who are asking for the same kind of permit. Um, during those hearings in 2007, uh, 2008, the group stated they had no plans to grow their membership, but this new proposal seems to be just that. It's a larger request for a larger number of people. Um, Mr. Mooney also stated in December, I believe, at the meeting in December, that they would not have the resources to make repairs to 713 West Ohio. Um, it's significant because the house on Michigan, 811, has been allowed to deteriorate and neighbors have submitted some photographs of that. If that property is not being cared for, I find it difficult to imagine that 713 West Ohio will fare any better. Um, the occupancy has been discussed, so I won't read everything I wrote here. Um, I'm a little confused. Mr. Mooney talks about 45 people. There are other conversations about 80 people. I don't know which it is. Um, but enforcement in particular for occupancy of the live-in residents is very difficult. We've had this issue throughout West Urbana for many years. A landlord can sign four names for, lease on, for leases and six kids will live there and no one can prove otherwise, no one can enforce the occupancy. Um, I think the same thing goes for enforcing the size of meetings. Our staff are very limited and you can't have somebody running out there every, during every meeting to, to count people. It's going to be very difficult. Um, the on street, the parking issue is long standing. There are high density residences along Lincoln that do not have enough on site property for all of their residents. They buy overnight permits. Those cars are parked bumper to bumper between about Lincoln and what, well, it would be Kohler. Uh, I, I cycle through there all the time, so I see that bumper to bumper. And that, that's weekends, nights all the time. I think when people do surveys and they go out there and it's between semesters or it's a weekend where kids tend to go home to do family things, the streets do clear out. But overall, I'd say the, the parking is very, very packed. Um, the on-site uh, spots at 713, the, the question I had here already came up. There will be staff from this group who will be using some of those on-site spaces. Uh, I don't really know. Um, someone else is going to address the McKinley parking lot situation, so I won't go into that here. Traffic along Busey um, is very, it's very congested. It's a narrow street. I, um, I've biked to campus down Busey for <coughs> 25 years. I know what that street looks like. Um, it's a lot of cars pulling into intersections looking for parking spaces. They're sitting idling. It can be very busy. I also noticed that when traffic is heavy on Lincoln, 
cars, and I do it myself, cars go over to Busey. They drive, drive up Busey. It's quicker than using Lincoln. So that's adding to the congestion on Busey. Um, I was fascinated by the 132 ingresses and egresses. <laughs> That's a lot of cars in and out. I think that's probably more traffic than the current 18 tenants is, are generating. Um, we've also looked at the livability issues for nearby neighbors, and I think that's pretty much been addressed. Um, traffic, parking, possible noise. Um, I think in particular the, the car door slamming late at night. Um, we're also wondering the 11.30 p.m. Meetings, any, we, I don't understand that gap, but 11.30 is late. Um, I also wanted to talk about the grandfathered in. That was probably a bad term. I'm responsible for that. The history of R7 district is, I tried to sort it all out. It would take a lot of time, but the Western Banner neighborhood was basically down zoned some decades back, and at that time, there are properties that were pre-existing uses. Um, there were a few rooming houses, there were the Greek houses. And they created these single parcel districts and I kind of object to the term district when you got a property like this that's surrounded by another kind of zoning. It's a, it's a district sounds like it's larger than it is. But if you look at that map, you will see that the preponderance of homes in the area. They're single family residential. Some, a few duplexes, a couple of small pre-existing apartments. But the grandfathered in thing um, was because those, those were uses that were existing when they started looking at zoning and changing zoning. Sorry. Um, I also read the letters of support in the staff report that said submitted by residents of the city. I find that some of them certainly were not residents of the city and, um, and I don't know what their interest in this case would be if they don't live here. And um, I don't know who this guy w is who runs the home inspection company. <laughs> he didn't give his address. Um, but they didn't seem like they lived close by and I think that's what cri what's critical. I, I actually live a little ways away, but, um, but I'm very interested in what happens to my town. I've lived here a long time. Thank you. Any questions? Oh. Nope. You're good. All right, anyone else in a, in a, who is opposed? My name is Diane Pleva. Thank you. Um, and I live at 607 West Ohio, so I live on the same block, but at almost the exact opposite end of the block of Ohio Street. And I just have a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, as one member has, has already noted, or actually as a couple people have noted, this designation is tied to the property. And I get concerned anytime I see a non-residential use being granted to a property in what I consider, in what ha in the city has considered a residential area. Um, as noted, the main purpose of this property is going to be as a church. There will be the 10 residents living there, um, but a church is a non-residential um, purpose. And I feel like this could potentially set up precedent that I don't really like to think too far down that line because I really like this area. Um, so I'm concerned a little bit about the future. Will this, will this designation change what can be done with the property in the future? So for example, if the building were to be added to or if it were to be torn down and rebuilt, does this and I understand that the current owners or the, the potential current owners have no interest in that, but because this designation sticks with the property, I'm, that's what I'm concerned about. Will this change what can be done with that property in the future? Um, I'm also slightly concerned about noise issues. According to my reading of the Urbana Noise Ordinances, noises associated with religious activities are exempt from those noise ordinances. And 80 people singing or chanting is quite loud, as I can attest, because I live through Rush every year. And we have sororities chanting and singing, and they are doing it inside their houses. And by the end of the week, I can sing along just by being in that proximity. Um, I have no problem with people wanting to express themselves in a creative manner, but do we have any recourse if this becomes injurious? Yeah. Right now, and while it is never pleasant to be woken up at two in the morning due to a bass thumping party, but I can call the city and the police are usually very, very responsive. 
can I do that um, when, we, when it's tied to a religious activity? People have already addressed parking, so I'm not really going to go into that. I will just point out that this evening I drove around the block before coming here. Um, there was a single parking space available at the very end of the block, so the exact opposite end of the block from um, 713, and there were no parking spaces available um, on, the, on BUC, on either block, north or south. So again, parking is at a premium, um, although I think that they have addressed that. And the gentleman who gave the presentation on behalf of the city mentioned being able to put restrictions on that permit, so limiting the congregation to 80 in attendance or limiting the number of occupants to 10. Is it possible to restrict the permit to this particular church? Or again, is this going to stick with the, the property forever? It would stick with the property. And there's no way to, I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking this as something that maybe the council could consider. Uh, we, well, we can't consider it because I guess if the zoning ordinance were changed, uh, but I didn't, it might even be a bigger issue than that. It, it might be uh, uh, a legal thing that, you know, the courts would have to rule right. on. We, can, we can't do anything about okay, it. Okay, and I understand that. Like I said, I just, this church, from, from the presentations that I've been given, it looks like a lovely group of people that have, you know, a, a fine mentality. What happens if they move? What happens if they change? What happens if their congregation changes? And I understand that you can never answer all the what ifs that can occur in life. But again, you are taking your residential property and giving it a non residential permit that stays tied to that property in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's again what concerns me. Um, also, for, for the first time at this meeting, I heard mentioned things like Sunday school, book sales. I understand that you can have a yard sale occasionally. Um, I don't know how regularly you can do that, but I'm pretty sure the city does have some ordinances on that. <clears throat> Sunday school, I don't know if there hits a point where you have to start regulating that. So these are things that, again, I feel like there are questions about that the community has not had really straight answers on. Um, and again, I'm not sure if the Planning Commission can consider the loss of tax revenue um, when looking into a proposed church space, but I do think that is, again, something to at least consider. We, we so. can consider that. I want to get clarification. Uh, I, I think we probably can, according to the I think we probably can, but we'll yeah. just that's, that's just something that. I would like to raise as consideration. It's not going to it's not going to be dispositive or anything like that. Right. Um, the the question of what happens if the building burns, uh, I assume that the special use permit and and the underlying zoning remain. It does. So the idea for change of ownership is basically that it, a new owner would need to operate the use under the same conditions and the same provisions that are outlined. Okay. So. And the reason we do that is so that if somebody does any other sort of business or whatever it is that requires a special use permit, they're making an investment and they should be able to, you know, put, give that to the, their son or something to run it. So as long as it's operating under the same uh, regulations, then it, yes, it does run with the land. If the building burnt down, um, I suppose if they could meet the current setbacks and development regulations and they rebuilt it the exactly the same size and, um, you know, as the site plan shows, then yes, I don't know that that's realistic, but um, it would need to really match what's what's presented today. Okay, that was part of my concern was if again the building burnt to the ground, would they be held to the same setbacks, to the same size issues, things like that? Okay, they would actually be held to today's standards. It it gets very complicated, <laughs> but um, if the whole thing goes down, correct me if I'm wrong, the whole thing goes down then um, they would need to build to today's setback standards okay. and all of that. So. I understand that. So those are just some of the concerns that have arisen just from reading some of the, uh, the documents made available and also from coming to this meeting. Great. So thank, thank you. And I'm going to change my answer on the taxes. I just went and looked at the special use permit, uh, and there's, it's all about the public convenience to the district, uh, whether it's detrimental or injurious to the district, and whether it conforms with applicable regulations. And cetera. the city so, attorney has also you. let us know that you cannot consider the loss of tax revenue. I, I agree now. Okay. I but anyway. Think, I, I just want to throw in there really quickly. Um, I understand if this is something that cannot be addressed today, but I do think that this, I would at least appreciate clarification on um, that, that noise ordinance because this has come up multiple times in this neighborhood from various different sources, um, just in terms of everything from singing, chanting, bell ringing, loudspeakers, etc. If it's related to a, to a religious activity, what sort of um, exemptions do they have? What sort of protections do residents have? That sort of thing. So again, just something that may need to be discussed at some point in the future. Okay. Thank you. Questions? No. We're good. Anybody else? Uh, Opposed? I think you you might be it. No? 
I'll, I'll ask again. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll sorry. No, that's all right. I'm just a lot farther away from you than she is. Okay. And would, Mr. Ritchie, would you Thank help me you. get the presentation up, please? My name is Louise Pooney. I live at 801 West Indiana, uh, which is the Smith Russell House. We have a very significant investment in a historic property that is a block from this proposed use. <laughs> Thank you very much. The arrows or the okay. I'll let you know if I have difficulty. Thank you. Okay. Now I, I see you've got a lengthy presentation here, and we do have all these in in the letter that you wrote us. We're gonna we're gonna so make if this you could, brief. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, okay. I think the first concern is that. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. That one might not be as good as the other one. I'm not sure. Okay. And I'm going to have trouble bending. I've got a bad back, but I'll try. Yeah. Maybe you can pull it there. You. How's that? I think it is better. Okay. So, I, I think my concern and the concern of many many of our neighbors is that we absolutely will honor the decision of this board and of the City Council. We just want to make sure that everyone has the facts. And there are a lot of sound bites out there um, and um, they're not necessarily aligned with what we believe is uh, reality. So we just kind of like to go through some of these points with you. Um, first of all, and I think what's probably most irritating is to compare this to the Zeta Tau Alpha House situation. Um, when that came up, if you remember, I came and spoke with you and then I came and spoke to the City Council and I wanted to ensure that this was not going to set a precedent. And here we are, it's not even six months later and it's listed as a precedent in a staff report and that's uh, a frustrating uh, situation. Um, this is absolutely a false uh, association. The Zeta Tau Alpha House and what uh, Mr. Milan is doing and he is here um, is, is investing very heavily in improving this property um, and making it an asset to the community, uh, not just the first reuse that comes along. So um, I, I, I um, also wanted to, I'm sorry, I forgot, Lori, hand these out. It's kind of a long term, these are just for people to pass around. I didn't want to make copies of of all of that, it's a lot of paper. Um, I, I would say that a side note that perhaps this body could consider at a future meeting is that the city really needs, in my opinion, a, a, a comprehensive adaptive reuse plan. Uh, what I'm sending around to you is, uh, I, I'm a nurse, I don't know anything about adaptive reuse except for in these kinds of situations. But in an hour on the internet, I was able to find a number of adaptive reuse policies, including three, four Greek houses in university towns. So whatever happens tonight is going to happen tonight, but I would strongly advise in the future that the city considers having some sort of a plan for this. If this is a problem and Greek houses are moving out of Urbana, we should be looking at the best possible adaptive reuse, not just whoever comes along. Is, is your intention to have these added to the record as part no. of I, Okay, great. Because I don't, I don't really think we can the way that... That's fine. Yeah. It, I just wanted to show that there were some sure. um, things readily there's, available. There's, if, a, there's it, options and alternatives out there. There are lots of options and alternatives out there in terms of significant planning and not just um, accepting something. So I, I think that a lot of people have spoken tonight and said that churches are good neighbors. And um, that's a nice sound bite, and it may be true in some situations, but this church has not been a good neighbor in the neighborhood that they've been in. Um, 811 West Michigan is in a state of disrepair. My neighbor um, that lives next door to that is not here, unfortunately, tonight, but she spoke pretty significantly at the neighborhood meeting, and um, she has uh, extensively and repeatedly asked the people that want to take over the 713 West Ohio building to make repairs, um, and they don't. And um, this now you can see the eaves are coming off of uh, that house. Uh, Sarah has repeatedly asked them to fix it, and if you look very closely, there is a squirrel in the eaves. There's a family of squirrels coming in and out of this house. So imagine how frustrated you would feel if you have an investment in your property, you're asking your neighbor to repair things, and it doesn't get repaired over a long period of time. So our concern is. You know, we, we can't pick and choose our neighbors, but why would we allow an organization that's not proven itself to be a good neighbor in terms of keeping maintenance up to have control over a much larger and more expensive property? 
Okay, the church says it values a quiet community. They said that tonight, they said that at the neighborhood meeting, they said that in the letter to the neighbors. But the fact is, and where the 1130 time came from, time frame came from is their own letter. Um, we're here tonight saying where the 1130 time frame come from, it's right here in their own letter to the neighbors. They said that oh. they, okay. So, and the 7 a.m. came from um, the fact that when they were issued a cease and desist order for 811 West Michigan uh, in 2008, they were operating in, at 7 o'clock in the morning. So there's, those, no, those times didn't come from nowhere. They came from their own documents and their own practices. Um, our opinion is that this is going to issue a lot of noise. There'll be headlights um, flashing in people's um, windows. And the idea of using screening is a little bit of pouring salt in a wound to the neighbors in this neighborhood because the plan commission, when it approved the extension to the other church in the area, Twin City Bible Church, put specific criteria on that and none of those have been met. It is 10 years later and they still not put up the screening. It's 10 years later and they have defied the plan commission's order not to um, create a through fare in their parking lot. It's, it, to us, Putting restrictions on uh, on a special use permit like this is useless because it didn't happen the last time around. So why would we believe that it's going to happen this time around? I understand you're doing your best by issuing that, but it's not reality. It doesn't happen. So we can't trust it. Um, so I think in, on this slide what I would highlight is that this is an, not a residential use of this building. <clears throat> and this is a residential neighborhood. If you look at the properties within 250 feet of, of the subject property, 72% are R2. We keep hearing tonight this is an R7 neighborhood. It's not an R7 neighborhood. If 72% are R2, I think it's an R2 neighborhood. Okay, this whole situation, and I'm confused by this, um, but that they're going to have a maximum of 70, 80 occupants is, um, uh, first of all, I don't think that it is enforceable. Uh, we can easily enforce what people are talking about. Loud parties at 2 in the morning, we call the police, they're very responsive, no problem. We're not going to stand outside of a building and count how many people are going in and out of it. So if they have more people in that building than 80, how can we possibly get that rectified? We've had complaints about Twin City Bible Church and their use of that property and nothing ever happens. And the building could easily, according to Mr. Ritchie's email that he sent me about a month ago or so, Marcus, you know, this is the... Um, the uh, math that he sent me in terms of how you calculate how many people per square foot. And um, the building we were told at the neighborhood meeting was 10,000 square feet. I have no personal knowledge of how big the building is. Um, but it's, it's large and using these calculations it could be much, much larger than 80 people allowed in the building. Another thing is the concern about 10 people living in the building. Again, what came first, the chicken or the egg, in terms of the parking lot versus how many people they're saying are, are going to occupy it. But the building, uh, the RSO office told me had uh, last a maximum occupancy of 40, which I think is what uh, was discussed here tonight. Um, and Mr. Mooney stated that uh, at the neighborhood meeting that it wouldn't just be students, it would be like-minded members of the community. So I just want to be clear that this is not necessarily going to be like uh, a, a Greek house or something like uh, you know the Newman Center where it's students. This could be anyone. And um, I think neighbors are concerned about safety, uh, food service, housekeeping, these types of things that we can be assured with an RSO organization are going to be safe for students. We don't have any idea how that's going to be uh, done here. Now, um, I, I don't know, Mr. Ritchie, if you can help me here, but this is a very interesting question about adequate parking. Um, and I apologize for my bad math here um, in terms of um, uh, my division, but I understand that what they're claiming, that what they want in terms of a maximum, barely meets what they have in their parking lot. This McKinley situation is very interesting. Um, my neighbors and I did a parking study uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we had repeatedly asked, and I have the emails, we'd repeatedly asked the city of Urbana to, a par to do a parking study because the traffic for Twin City Bible Church is an absolute nightmare and hazard on Sundays, and it was never done. And we thought that they were going to try to buy the Kappa Delta building, so we did our own parking study. I have pictures here. I don't know if you want me to project these or what. I didn't anticipate doing this tonight, but I have pictures of an absolutely full McKinley parking lot. I can't answer to why it wasn't full on Sunday and it was full when we went there. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it was full. And it is an absolute Actually, hazard. We, we can see it in your slide here. Fine. 
It's a hazard uh, in the community in terms of people running across Lincoln and blocking uh, nearby streets. So I, I just, um, I wish there were a way for you to come there on a Sunday morning and see what traffic is like in that area. Adding anything to it will make our lives even more miserable. You know, characterizing all Greek houses as having red solo cups, which we heard tonight all over the lawn, is, is not the case. Um, we've got the Kappa Delta house at the end of our block. We've never heard anything except for, I have to admit, during rush week, we hear the chants. And yes, I think I do have them memorized after a day or two. Um, but the, uh, most Greek houses are not a hazard. They're not all animal house. Um, and, you know, I, I'm only about a block or a teeny bit lo uh, further from there, actually four properties, and I've never heard anything in the six years that we've been there. So I, 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 I'm, it's just not our um, experience. The other thing here that I think is important is the last bullet point. When we bought our homes, we knew we were investing near Greek houses. That's quite obvious. We didn't know that we were going to have another church that's already creating uh, or creating a hazard above and beyond what we already have. Um, there are statements about um, both the neighborhood meeting and inferred in the staff report that you know this could be a last resort for this building. It's going to be it's going to be boarded up if we don't if somebody doesn't buy it. All these other Greek houses are having problems. That is not reality. The building hasn't been vacant and. Again, I would appreciate it if the, this body would, at a future date, try to uh, encourage a comprehensive plan for adaptive reuse of these properties. Um, you know, we were told at the neighborhood meeting that improvements would be made to the building, but we haven't been told anything about what that would be. And how we got the 1950s for the electrical is, I, that was specifically asked at the neighborhood meeting, and that was the answer that was given to us. We asked how old is the electrical because we're concerned about safety, and we were told 1950s. If that's incorrect and now it's later, then that's fine. We were given two different decades. So um, in terms of the... Um, three criteria that you need to consider. We do not believe that um, this use is con conducive to the public uh, convenience of the neighborhood residents. I'm not talking about students, I'm talking about the neighborhood residents. Um, homeowners and residents in the area will not benefit from this church because the church is, is looking to, um, to serve as students. And uh, we don't have to be concerned. Of course, I would never want to prevent someone from practicing their religion, but they have a current space to operate, and we wouldn't be denying them the ability to practice their religion. Um, it, it would be a uh, detriment to the residential district in terms of uh, foot and vehicular traffic and uh, headlights and noise. And then, again, this is an R2 neighborhood. 72% of the properties are R2. Long hours of operation every day of the week is more of a business occupancy than, let alone an R2, or than even an R7 occupancy. And we do believe that it would be um, uh, fundamentally changing the essential characteristics of uh, the neighborhood. Um, and again, the last point here is critical. We don't believe that enforcement of these limits is possible. We've had a nightmare with enforcement of anything with Twin City Bible Church, and as hard as we try and put, to put conditions on this, we just don't think it's feasible. Great. Any questions? Oh, thank you for thank you. moving through that rather quickly. I appreciate it. Anyone else wish to address the plan commission in opposition to this? Sir? You'd sign a paper and uh, state your name. That would be great. Thank you for the opportunity to address the commission. My name is Evan Malhado. I live at 612 West Ohio Street. Uh, which is scarcely a block from the property in question. I have lived at 612 West Ohio Street since 1988. Uh, and uh, I have two points to make, one of which I think is uh, centrally important, the other I'll confess is a bit peripheral. Uh, the first point is to place in juxtaposition two of the uh, points made by the previous speaker. Uh, <clears throat> is this a residential district or is it some kind of other an R7 district? It seems to me that uh, what you've got is basically a, a residential area and there are these other structures that have R7 status that have acquired that status as a result of 
one presumes from what has been said tonight, a series of historical accidents. And it is not clear that the way to deal with the character of this neighborhood is to perpetuate those accidents uh, on an ad hoc basis and moreover uh, to give in fact the special use to one of those properties that as has been stated by others may carry long-term implications that could be undesirable and that are difficult uh, to foresee in, in all of their fullness. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the second thing is and, and this is where I'm, I'm pulling these two points together that she made. Um, we have this set of historical accidents. We have a situation in which apparently fraternities and sororities, uh, at least in their residential character, are going into decline. That suggests the possibility of having an overall plan that would allow one to uh, reduce the accidental character of the zoning in this area and impose on it some kind of rational plan um, that would be consistent with the uh, residential character of the neighborhood. So that's the first point I wanted to make. I wanted to bring those two things together. The second thing that I want to make is uh, not so central, uh, but I think it is significant, especially in light of the uh, number of comments that have been made today about traffic and parking and so on. In all the years that I have lived on Ohio Street, almost nothing has been done uh, to preserve the character of the pavement of the street. This is only two blocks. Ohio Street is two blocks long. But because of the proximity of all of these group uh, housing arrangements, there's a lot of traffic uh, that goes along. Ohio Street and also because of the proximity to Lincoln Avenue and people use Ohio Street as a way to get to uh, Orchard Street from Lincoln and so on. there is a lot of traffic on this street and <clears throat> from the proposal that is being made it seems that th this church would entail a significant addition to the traffic on Ohio Street. If you take a bike or a car and go along Ohio Street, I do both of those things all the time, you have a bone rattling experience. And it seems to me that uh, the quality of the pavement is not gonna get any better if there is additional traffic along the street. I think the city needs uh, to take the state of the street into account uh, when it is considering the use of the properties along that street. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Machado? No? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wish to uh, speak in opposition? No? Nope. Would the petitioners like to answer any of the co anything that was brought up in opposition, or you, you think you're good? If so, please, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, the, pet the petitioner himself needs to come forward. You can come with him. The, uh, one of the things about the late or the nights, um, actually all the meeting times are over by 9 or 9.30. Uh, there is one meeting we said that goes to 10. Um, we can adjust that one. The 11 o'clock was a um, quiet time. In other words, the meeting is over. Again, we're talking about students. They like to uh, hang around a little bit, talk with one another. That's the whole, that's, that's the reason. The congregational portion is always over by 9.30. Um, and some of the students might want to hang around a little bit, talk to one another. Um, that's why we said the quiet time starts at 11 and non-resident is out at 11.30. Um, now let's, let's take a look at a, uh, say a Tuesday night prayer meeting, 7.30 to 8.30. 40 participants uh, at, um, and one, uh, so based on the ratio of uh, cars, that would, that would be probably about eight cars on that. There would be eight cars be coming on that, that time. Um, so the big, the big traffic time is, in fact, Sunday morning. The other times, uh, the, uh, in fact, that's the largest, yeah, that's the largest uh, gathering um, other than 
Saturday, um, but 48 cars. So we're not talking about huge amounts of traffic in the evenings, uh, just Sunday morning. Um, and the, uh, so we're pretty much, we've already built in the requirement because we're not going to be having congregational singing at 10 o'clock. Uh, these, this is all uh, four or five, 10 extra students talking, talking to one another and that's all. Um, there is, uh, I th uh, the idea of weddings have been brought up at one point in time somewhere. Um, again, everybody, we, uh, all of our members basically are, are from out of town. Uh, we have maybe one wedding every other year. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Hopkins, did, did I hear what you said? Your members are all from out of town? Yes, they're students. They're students from out of town. But they, they live, live, but they live sorry, okay. they live on campus. Right. I, yeah. yeah, sorry. Understood. Yeah, sure. they live on campus. They live on campus, but their home is somewhere else. Gotcha. Um, for, uh, for um, so my stepson lived in Champaign, but got married in uh, Boston. Okay, that's, we, that, we, we understand. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So that's that's why we have so few for so few weddings. Um, so, um, yeah. Other okay, other questions? For Any further questions? I think I think we've got it. Okay. All right. My, Thank you. My only quick comment would be, um, uh, you know, so much of going through this process with the neighborhood meeting and, and the feedback and comments. I would simply say that um, it, that I do encourage you know what has happened with Twin City Bible Church to not letting that affect this process. That I encourage you to think of those as two different things. And it's pretty clear there's still a lot of frustration about how that's gone down, both from the city standpoint and from the the residents in the area. So, okay, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, that concludes the public input portion of this hearing, and now we will uh, begin discussion. Are there any uh, points of discussion that people want to uh, talk about? If not, I suggest we <clears> – I think that there are very specific criteria for a special use permit. Um, and uh, they're in the zoning ordinance. It's not like the LaSalle criteria, which are – law but but not a specific mandate uh, on this commission or on the city council um, so th the proposed use is conducive to the public convenience at that location I, th I assume I s suspect this one goes well it could be the traffic the traffic issue is clearly one of the issues that came up the most often um, so in regards to that, I mean, uh, I suppose this could is, – is, is an increase in traffic going to be conducive to the public convenience? Number two, is it going to be injurious or detrimental to the district in which it's located? Uh, and is it going to preserve the essential character of the district? Those are really the three criteria, if we're in fact convinced that there will be an increase in, in traffic. The city engineer doesn't think so. Any, uh, somebody's got to have an opinion. Uh, no. Ms. Medrago? No, I don't, I don't, I didn't gather from any of the information presented that the increase Could in traffic. Yeah, I didn't gather that from any of the information presented that the increase in traffic for this church would occur during rush hour, for example, when other increases in traffic happen. Um, or during you know peak times for certain things, um, but uh, I would be interested if someone thinks an addition anything in addition to that or contrary to that. I just thought I'd mention that. Is uh, there are, are there other ideas that, maybe seems that I didn't think of? Or? That seems like a fair point. I think uh, it goes to Mr. Trail's point that he made started to make and then turned it into a question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, about is it the hours of operation of this church or the hours of operation of, of any church? So right now, I, I think you're probably right. Um, I, and I don't know if any church, you know, I don't, I don't know. To, 
you know, th we've got a rush hour, a rush few minutes around five o'clock. Um, so your point could be could be valid, I, I, especially with this particular church. But with it's another one, I I don't know. Right, especially yeah. if that's one of the main complaints is that it would have an increase in traffic. Uh huh. Okay. Mr. Trail. I just, having lived in a lot of places, uh, I, I don't think of Champaign Urbana as having traffic at all. <laughs> um, but um, nor really a parking problem. I've lived places with real parking problems. Um, it's all relative. Yeah. I, yes. Definitely. Uh, sort of part of a lot of all of this is you know we're sort of bound by the zoning law right and you don't go to war with the zoning ordinance you wish you had to go with the zoning ordinance you got <laughs> and the whole reason as stated in here for the r7 district revolves around two things one is protecting nearby low residents uh, low density residential districts um, and two is preserving the current buildings in their current mm -hmm. form. Um, I kind of all of it is, and toward that is one specific thing called out in the ordinance, an ordinance, a use specifically envisioned by the ordinance writers is a church. So. That's right. I don't know whether that means it limits us in our deliberation or our decision making to basically, unless we could find some reason why this particular proposal for a church would be specifically. Otherwise, the zoning ordinance specifically says a church. The, the zoning one is specifically on the table yeah, of use. Specifically, one of the. Uh, the Oh, for a special use. For a special use. Yeah. yeah. Speci okay. Specifically yeah. calls out church yeah. as a special okay. That's use. That's right. Which I assume is, you know, the ordinance writers assume that was compatible with, with uh, a residential areas, since most churches are in residential areas, um, and was also compatible with the other you know, intent of the ordinance, which is to preserve the buildings. Um, so. I hesitated to, you know, let it boil down to you like or dislike a particular church or a particular no. times that a church wants to. I, well, I think reasonable limit, limitation on how late they can meet or even how early they can meet might be. To, I, I us happen to, to sort of, yeah. you know, yeah. sympathize with the enforceability. It's it's nice to, but what's the mechanism? For I don't know really about enforcing the that. I do, I do not know. Um, so I find myself, you know, as long as someone doesn't come along and say, oh, definitely we're going to meet 24 hours a day and have loudspeakers in the front yard and, you know, all of that, it seems pretty hard to deny a special use unless you've really got strong, in this instance, unless you've got fairly good reason for doing so. Well, that's why I went to the three criteria, because the – for us to approve a special use, a church which is specifically listed as one for this zoning district, it must be conducive to the public convenience, must not be injurious or detrimental to the district, and must preserve the essential character of the district. And in this instance, the essential character of the district is essentially keeping <laughs> the building. That's what this particular zoning was, one of, one of its major reasons. Um, that, that's an, I, think, I think you're making a really interesting point, and I just want to ask city staff something. Is the district that we're trying to preserve R7, or is it the neighborhood? Again, I'm sticking to the zoning ordinance. Um, yes, I believe it is the district, meaning the zoning district. That's how we interpret it. Which I, is, I think, where you were going? Yeah, I mean, that's the specific reason why it was created, to preserve these buildings in their current location in a, in a, in a residential area. Um, so uh, unlike sort of kind of the usual thing where it's, you know, this seems a little more weighted toward, I mean, it's a zoning district specifically created to, to protect the buildings. 
in, in most ways. So I don't know. It's like harder for me to to. Uh, it seems like the weight is toward as long as it's not anything, you know, obviously problematic. And I sympathize with people's, you know, suggestions about the potential of the way be people may or may not behave in the future, but I don't know how much of that we're really allowed to take into consideration um, when judging a use, you know. Probably not. Yeah. Um, so, so let me see, see if I could take what you're driving at and put it back in context of the, of the criteria. Do you think that, based on the discussion we just had, that a church as a special use is uh, not unreasonably injurious, injurious or detrimental to the district in which it will be located, which is R7 in this case? And, and if, if you do not think that, then we check it off and the, the special use permit meets that criteria. And right or wrong, I mean, my sort of take on that is unless there's something in the specifics of their proposal that we say that's kind of not what we do and envision as a church and probably was not within it, what... They're doing something that's not a church, in other words. Well, yeah. or something that whoever wrote the ordinance didn't envision as a church-like activity. Sure. Sure. Um, then I kind of think we kind of passed that. Right, that would be more of a uh, probably an enforcement issue. We're a church, but we rent it out for banquets, is that, which, you know, would, might not be a church use. But that's, that's a, totally hypothetical, you know, speculative. Mr. Hopkins, you're shaking your head. It's just churning away out there. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, we're going to need it. Um, okay. Now, the other one is that the proposed... This is number three. The proposed use conforms to the applicable re regulations, preserves the essential character of the district in which it's located. And we get almost to the same point that you were just at. If it, if, does it preserve the essential character if a church is specifically mentioned as something that can be a special use? Sounds like you're saying that the, the people who wrote the zoning ordinance think, yes, it would preserve the essential character of R7. And also, the original writers there the envisioned that their idea of church-like activities were by almost by definition compatible with. Now, obviously they didn't think any church proposal would be or it wouldn't be a special use. Otherwise it would have just been a by right. Oh, right, right, sure. So are we going to check off number three? I'm, I'm not sure I'm there yet, but... Yeah, okay, well, um, then we won't check it off. I'll, I'll scratch I, I, that out. Just for, for context and clarity, a church is a special use in, I think, every residential district, starting with R1. Oh. So this is not unique <laughs> to R7. It's about Permitted in all this. a whole long legal, conventional, <laughs> traditional, cultural <laughs> history of how churches are treated, by treated in regulation and then how they relate to residential neighborhoods. So th the notion that a church belongs in R7 is, that, that doesn't quite work. The notion that a church subject to conditions, or actually to special uses, because conditional is something mm -hmm. else, belongs in residential neighborhoods is pretty much pervasive throughout the zoning ordinance. Although the thing here is that, in fact, when they created it, they specifically said, we are not excluding churches. It, they're, they're saying that for R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7. But they could have easily exempted They created a special district. They could have it left, it, a they the could have left it out. We, we could have tried. <laughs> Legally, it would have been extremely yeah. difficult because of a large context of legal cases, uh, federal legislation, um, et cetera, in culture. I, so I, I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't know that it matters all that much. I'm just trying to make sure that argument isn't going somewhere that maybe is 
not as specific. So I, I, I've got a couple questions. The, the special use permit would go with the entire property, including the portion that is used as a rooming house? It goes with the use that is subject to the requirements of a special use permit. So if a use is allowed by right, it, you don't need to approve that, if I'm getting your question correct. Um, it, I, I, I guess I'm trying to be a little more picky or precise. Mm -hmm. um, If a physical portion of the building, and let's say an identifiable physical portion of the building, is used as a rooming house, does the special use permit preclude that part of the building being used for church purposes? So the church would only be able to occupy the areas for which they are approved to occupy if they're coming in and uh, with 10 residents, for example, then those areas where the 10 residents would reside, you could not do a church use there. And that's not simply because of parking requirements? Correct. So the special use permit, to go back to your original question, is only valid for the area that they are approved to operate a church in. Okay, so this gets me back a little bit to the questions I've asked before. It seems to me that the conditions we're trying to apply apply to a portion of a building. And yet we have no information about the building with which to apply those conditions or at least I don't have any information about that. You're essentially setting the conditions to help design how the building would be used. The condition that was recommended by staff was specifically about the assembly hall. If plan commission wanted to place other church-related conditions that they thought were appropriate for other portions, that would presumably be within your authority. But we did not recommend any conditions for the residential portion of the building because that's not I, part I, of the special use permit. I, I understand that. It's just that I don't know what portion of the building that is. And um, if, if um, in, in having in mind that we are making a zoning special use permit, uh, without being too nasty, I'm just getting late, uh, much of what we've been listening to is actually not pertinent because we are not making a decision for a particular church. We're making a decision for a particular use. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that um, I, I see no way that I know that um, the portion of the building used for church purposes and the number of rooms in which there could be simultaneous meetings at the same time by some future church um, um, the, it, churches, many churches used to be built with expandable spaces. Um, so at whatever, depending on their religion, at Christmas or Easter or uh, whatever, you can have twice the congregation. Now that might not apply to this church, but this church is actually not the issue. And so I feel like I don't quite have the information framed in a way that the kind of limits that seem appropriate for the particular location that 
might be good because of R7 and being able to use the building and being somewhat uh, similar to a R7 use. I don't, I don't know how to apply the, the rules. I don't know how to apply the rules. Mr. Trout? I, he put it in good words because the assembly hall isn't the church. It's the assembly hall plus some unspecified number of rooms of sizes or locations. Like, for instance, does this building have a full basement, which isn't currently being used for, but, you know, is large enough and open enough to be used for meetings? Uh, and I assume they would have to, at some point, specifically say, this is a church and this is the rooming house because this is the part you're going to you're going to expect inspect as a rooming house and this is the part you whatever inspection you're going to do that this is the inspection portion for a church so when we keep limiting it to the assembly hall well if it's the assembly hall plus you know 12 large rooms and an entire basement and a kitchen and a whatever does that mean when we say 80 we're limiting the entire occupancy of any kind to that portion of the building to 80 only one room to 80 at which they can have as many people as they want maybe not this church but maybe some future church i mean maybe you keep you're nodding your head so i'm i'm assuming i could probably stop talking and you've gotten all our points I think, yeah. yeah um so john schneider can correct me if i'm misstating but uh, perhaps we were too limited in the condition the intent was typically anyway uh, when a service is going on, there aren't people in the office because they're at the service. So perhaps if the language and the condition were expanded to um, the occupancy for the church use, and jump in, John, if it needs to be tightened, um, is set at no more than 80. I believe that's what I'm hearing. So that would get at in case there is that separate classroom going on. Well, that, that, that may be something to discuss, but I think that makes enforcement even harder. I mean, you know, but John, maybe. Yeah, please. This just goes hand in hand with zoning, but um, in section, 1004.1.1 it talks about the areas without fixed seating and it uh, gives a formula for how it's supposed to be calculated mm -hmm. but there's an exception in that section it says where approved by the building official the actual number of occupants for whom each occupied space floor or building is designed although less than those determined by calculation shall be permitted to be used in the determination of the design occupant load so what the, we take that to mean is when we would do, um, we work with the fire department very closely, and when we um, issue a certificate of occupancy, the occupant load is indicated on the certificate of occupancy for uh, specified areas. Mm -hmm. and in this case, we could issue a certificate of occupancy for no more than 80 persons in the church use, and then no more than 10 residents in, you know, for the uh -huh. residential use. And then for enforcement, um, if people suspect that there are more than 80 persons in in the church use during any time uh, I spoke to the fire chief how we would enforce this and he would say he told me that with any any kind of situation if you suspect over occupancy a uh, person can call 911 the MedCat operator ask for the fire marshal they will connect them with the fire marshal and the fire marshal will be called out and the way the process works is the building would be deoccupied and then they would count back the number of people. You don't count people coming out, you just count back the people going back in, and then huh. at that point, no one else would be allowed back in the building. But the, the other part of that is, is at any time, if, you know, if this is a continued violation, then uh, the building official can revoke the CFO, and I, mm -hmm. as I understand, I heard before, the zoning administrator can also take action to re yeah. revoke the uh, special use mm -hmm. permit. Okay, is that helpful? 
I mean, it's, it gives us some things to think about, I think. I, I'm beginning to think that I don't want to write subtle language mm -hmm. in real time. Yeah, I get you. Um, uh. And I don't like to do such things, but I would be tempted to continue this to a specified date with request that the language be prepared. If you could provide more specific direction on that language, that would be appreciated. Yeah. Well, I think you've come close by, by what you're by suggesting, you say, yeah. but my, again, my main concern is writing language in real time, uh, worrying about what's going on in Washington where they're writing 600 pages in real time, you know, it's part of what reminds me that I don't like to write three lines in real time. But um, I, I, and, and I understand how the language works from a fire marshal point of view. Um, Part of what I want to make sure of is I don't think this is a fire marshal issue. And what I mean by that is a, the reason for fire marshal may be the way to enforce it, but the reasoning for a limit on occupancy is based on the special use conditions of the location of this facility. And um, I, I can foresee a notion that if this is viewed as a fire marshal question, that the occupancy could be easily appealed or remodeled or reclaimed because the fire marshal conditions would not actually apply. It would be the zoning, it would be the special use permit conditions. And that's what John said during his statement, is that the building official can set a number that is lower than what you would calculate. I, so that is what the rule is. Um, it, but is that setting by the building official in the special use permit? And how does it apply? I mean, I, I understand where we are. I'm just... Um, not quite ready to do this in real time. I think uh, we thought this through very specifically and thought that this method would be the best way to do the enforcement because we did hear that concern at the neighborhood meeting so we did have these discussions with the fire marshal with the fire department and with with building safety. Um, the fire marshal I, I don't know if it's routinely but does go out on sites to do the same activity and so this is the best way that we could think of to enforce the concern from the neighborhood about the occupancy. I think yeah. maybe what you're, I think, I think you're on the right track probably. I think what Lou's saying is how does it apply to this space and which parts of the building count as a church use versus a residential use? I think we need to understand that better. And once we understand that better, then we could craft language for the condition that might more accurately reflect our understanding. Does that make sense, Mr. Trail? I have a question just for a moment. We don't even know what port other than something called the assembly hall. Sure, that's right. By the time they designate, right, I assume that the building's been evaluated for 40 residents and meets fire code for egress and all of that kind of stuff. How many people could the building hold under you know fire regulations that'd be interesting are we could it even hold 80 does it have i mean does it have adequate egress does it have you know my guess is it can hold way more that's than what i think fire regulations yeah. that's, that's my guess it. too yes. but how do you know until you know which portion of okay. the building they've designated yes. true okay so i think where we're at on this is that we're going to continue this until is our at the next meeting uh what is the date of our next meeting? The next meeting is February 22nd. February 22nd. So we will continue this hearing, no objections? Okay. Do, okay. do you, I mean, we have to actually do that, yeah. right? But you're going to, that's okay. That, that's, yeah, yeah. Do, can I get a motion to, to continue the meeting? All right. 
I, I know that we Mr. Continue Hopkins. This case. We continue this case. Yeah, not the meeting. Correct. The meeting of February 22nd. 22nd. Okay, that's a Which motion. Means that we do not have to notify because we have given a specific date Correct. for a specific case. I'm saying that on purpose so that people out there might hear that statement. And it's part of the motion. Yep. So, we get a second? I will second and then immediately, I don't know whether we need to make this an amendment, but if there are specific information that we want from staff in preparation I, for that meeting, in our minds right now, this would probably be a good time to make that clear. Um, it, we better ask that before we continue the, the thing, so. Can we simply do that prior to voting? Yes, you can. You, no, you can second it, and then we can discuss further. Uh, I'm going to second that. Yeah, okay. Motion, Mr. Hopkins. Second, Mr. Trail. Now, if you have specific requests, uh, make it now. Um, well, I think the clear request is we'd like to see the What portion of the building, building is going to yeah, be used for what? What, is, what's, what we're actually talking about specifically. Which portion of the building will be the church? Which portion of the building will be the residence? So you would want finished building plans designating which I, portions I'm a, of what the we're, building I are I think used what we're saying life. is that the special use only applies to the portion designated as a church, and we don't know what portion that is. To, to, to be clear, there is a likelihood, if not immediately, that at some point there will be remodeling of the spaces. So. I don't view this as asking for a proposed remodeling of the spaces. It's, it's what's in this building now and how are we ma imagining this, you know, in rough terms, what spaces, what configurations is this all about? And then in what ways might we be able to specify more precisely what conditions and limitations there are. And, and from my point of view, that's thinking toward a future user, not the immediate user of the special use permit. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful? Ms. Bledrago? So what's missing from this part, the Urbana Zoning Ordinance requires a special use permit to allow the proposed church, to allow the proposed church use in the R7 University Residential Zoning District. The rooming house use is permitted by right in the R7 district. The church would operate in one part of the principal structure while the rooming house would operate in another part. Are our concerns already satisfied? by just that opening introduction? What's missing from the opening introduction? Because I feel like but we, maybe I'm not getting something, but I feel like the concerns are addressed in the first couple sentences of the report. Well, th let me give an example. Okay. I have no idea what the relative square foot of the two portions is. I therefore don't have an idea of what the potential <coughs> expansion <laughs> or uh, differing use, differing uh, pattern of use as a religious institution might be. And um, because we've focused so much on the details of this organization, um, I don't see how that can become part of the details of a special use permit that goes with the property. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, um, I th maybe I think I'm not making sense. I don't know. They're just saying that they, w they want to know more about, in general terms, what is the plan for the specific uses of each half so that they can get their head around what, if any, conditions to apply to this if we choose to approve it. 
Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, we can only apply the conditions to part of the building. Right, right. Because the, the rooming house is a, is a permitted use. And so we're not giving a special use permit to a piece of land, which is kind of ironic. Um, or at least I don't think we are. And I'm also not 100% sure, sure that, that, that we're doing that, yeah. which is part of the thing that I'm trying to get through my own head. Yeah, if you could make sure that that's what we're doing, too. <laughs> and maybe it's not what we're doing. I don't know, but I can't well, figure it out. If, if I could speak to the, the conditions that the plan commission are able to put, it talks about things like regulate the location, extent, and intensity of such uses, adherence to a site plan, require landscaping and the screening of, of those methods. I'm tr in trying to figure out how to give you the information that you need, looking at the zoning ordinance, okay, trying to, trying yeah. to enforce the requirements of the zoning ordinance. So if it's a concern about parking, if it's a concern about so again, I can't do it in real time because I don't know enough. But um, for example, if this is a 10,000 square foot building, are we in fact giving a special use permit to 6,000 square feet of the building? Or are we giving a special use permit to the whole building? Because we're not dealing with the dormitory part of it because we can't. Right. Okay? I don't know the answer to that. And I don't think we can create it before my mind gets further shot than it already is. <laughs> and part of my confusion, at least, is when we say the dormitory part of it, it's in essence all a dormitory now. So w with a 40 person occupancy limit. So where, now they're gonna, we're gonna limit to 10. Where's the 10? How much of the building is that? Is it, when we do, I mean, really, this gets down to, can they change the part of the building? Can they, I mean, if you start tearing out walls and doing whatever, can they say, okay, well, it used to be over here, but now it's over here. I don't know that that changes our conditions, but without some idea of what we're really, I'm kind of concerned, really, whether we're doing the building and the land or the land. That's kind of, um, you know, a big issue for me. Yeah, because since, could they go, can they do more than 10 and still, if they decided next to have 20 people live there and say, in essence, we're going to use less of the building as a church, is that okay? Well, that would have be. Have they permanently reduced their boarding house occupancy to 10 by mm -hmm. what we're doing? No, if it's a permitted use. We can't, yeah. we can't do anything. Correct. Yeah. And I will ask, before you do take a vote, I wanted to see if the applicant, one, is okay with that date and thinks they would be able to produce the kinds of floor plans that you're requesting by that date so that if that doesn't work for them, then we can choose the next date. Well, while they're conferring, it, it seems to me there, there are also staff tasks here of figuring out how this applies to building and land and so on. And I don't know that we need anything other than the existing building floor plans. The layout, yeah. And some indication of how, roughly what part do you think is going to fall where? Well, right? I, I, theoretically, gonna... staff could just tell us you're just, it's a conditional permit of the, you know, and you don't get to decide which part of the building or anything. It's just. Well, but it's not clear we can do this. That's the problem. Yeah. All right. Anyway. I'm sorry. Ms. Way Drago. I just, I'm only going to say one more thing. Oh, okay. You, just make sure you're on. Um, I'll just say one more thing. All right. And I won't s probably say anything after oh. that. Um, the first sentence of the report says that Weisskopf has applied for a special use permit to adaptively reuse 
adaptively reuse the existing dormitory at 713 West Ohio Street as a church and rooming house, period. I think we're talking about the whole structure. I think we're talking about the whole property. That's all I'm going to say. That's well, that, that, yeah. that's and, right. And if that's the case, <laughs> yeah. that's the problem. That's yeah. exactly, you're exactly right. Okay. That, and we're not sure. And so that's okay. really what yeah. we're asking. Yeah. Great. Nice. So I'm glad you said one more thing. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Um, great, great insight. So, gentlemen? Yeah. Okay. So, again, the motion is to uh, continue this until February 22nd. And we'll do this on a roll call. Mr. Fitch? Yes. Mr. Hopkins? Yes. Ms. Wadrago? Yes. Mr. Trail? Yes. Ms. Billman? Yes. That motion passes. So we'll see uh, you back on February 22nd. Ms. You, you may rejoin us for this case. It's not going to take any time. <laughs> what, what case? We've got another plan case. Oh, are you? It's going to be continued. Oh, okay. You want to say that the meeting's not over? So the meeting's not over, over, please. The meeting's not over, please. If you could, if you're still in the room, if you could sit down, please. Please, the meeting's not over. If you're going to stay in the room, I need you to be quiet, please. The meeting's not over. No, thank you. Okay, now I'm going to uh, open uh, plan case number two. 2331T18, a request by the zoning administrator to amend the urbanic zoning ordinance to modify who may submit an application for various permits and approvals. This case is going to be continued to the March 8, 2018 Plan Commission meeting. So we don't have any new business. Does anyone in the audience wish to address us on something other than the case that we just continued that pertains to planning and zoning? No? Okay. Uh, staff report? No staff report, no study session, therefore we are adjourned.